Welcome to How Not to DM. I'm your host, Derek. Thanks for joining me on my quest to interview the very best dungeon masters on this plane of existence. Today, I'm talking to Ryan, the mastermind behind D&D Compendium, a library of over 1,000 links to online resources that make it easier for you to run your D&D game. Ryan talked about some of his DMing experience and also gave great advice to content creators out there looking to make their mark on the industry and produce useful tools. Enjoy! I, out of high school, began playing a campaign with some friends of mine from college. We were doing Dragon Age RPG and then swapped over to Pathfinder. Didn't get past level three in Pathfinder, but we had a lot of fun adventures for about a year. I know it's crazy. It was like a whole year of adventuring. And we only got to level three. It's very crunchy. The system is very crunchy. But then uh, I grew kind of estranged from them and didn't play for a couple of years. And then first day of class in one of my college classes, one of my best friends from high school walks in and we had a whole bunch to catch up on. And during our kind of catching up conversation, he mentioned that he was playing D&D at the local game store and invited me to play. So I was like, sure. I mean, I've never tried D&D before, never played it, but you know, I've, I've done a little bit of role playing stuff before. So this could be fun, um, especially if, you know, if he was there, he's one of my best friends. So I ended up learning the system at the game store and started DMing in the the winter after playing from the fall to the winter of that year all right yeah it, it's always good when you get introduced by friends because i feel like you already kind of have that that person you can ask questions and and be more comfortable around i know it was like that for me so it's kind of an easy transition into something that might be a little different definitely it's what i recommend for people too is you know if you can get in with your friends to play that's one of the better ways to go in like from a cold start on the system. What is your DMing experience? You mentioned you've played a few other versions, but have you um, DM'd or, or game mastered any of those other systems or has it all been Dungeons and Dragons? So I hadn't actually taken up the mantle of DM uh, at all until I felt comfortable with 5th edition D&D. I have experience with homebrew campaigns mainly uh, and homebrew groups, but I've also gotten into some of the modules. I started the Tomb of Annihilation Dungeon Masters Discord server because I've run Tomb of Annihilation halfway through with like four different groups. But never quite got to the end of it because several reasons. We could talk about those later, perhaps. I've run games in game stores. Uh, I ran a one shot during the, the free RPG day one time. I've run games mostly at home and then I've started running games online during the pandemic. So lots of different places, oh, lots yeah. of different experiences. What was your first DMing experience? Was it a homebrew game? Was it a pre-written adventure? And tell us kind of how it went for you. It's always scary starting out DMing, and I had no clue really where to start. But I had a lot of support from my, my local game store. The DMs there, obviously, they're, they're wanting to kind of groom these DMs and, and get people running games. Because there were always like the same four or five DMs at the game store. And they want more people to learn how to run the game so that they can eventually bring people out of the game store to give more room for new players. So I started prepping to DM and it was all homebrew. Uh, I didn't own any of the starter kits. I didn't read any of the starter kit stuff. I just got the core three books, you know, Player's Handbook, Monster Manual, and Dungeon Master's Guide. And I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to go research and find some resources and save up a whole bunch of Google documents for building my world. And I started filling my world with festivals and people and cities and things that were going on. And then a few weeks into it, I was like, you know what? I'm ready to start with my friends. So we gathered around a table and, and made characters and had our little kind of session zero. And the first quest, I ended up having a very kind of naive, like fighter guard person that the party ended up hating because he was kind of annoying. He was kind of endearing to the party. But the, the first quest ended up being really interesting because the party was kind of sent out to investigate what was going on with a little town that was outside of one of the big cities. And the town's water supply was tainted with myconid spores. Those are those like big mushroom creatures things underground. Of course, the party didn't know this, but the town was being driven mad. All of the locals were drinking the groundwater and then they were going mad and it was basically like we happy few. And so they were kind of aggressive and scary to the players. So they had to go investigate and see what was going on. Uh, and then they eventually made their way to a cave outside of town. And then inside the cave where all the, the groundwater was, was running through, they saw a whole colony of myconids. And so they had to determine whether they wanted to kill them or force the Myconids to relocate. And of course they were very resistant to relocation. So a very interesting combat ensued. 
that's some pretty intelligent game design for for the very start of someone's DMing career. I guess a lot of people I've talked to recently jump in without having played a little bit. So I, I feel like that was kind of a, a good transition for you. And it sounds like it went about as smoothly as you can ask for a, a first game you run yourself. There was a lot of help too. I didn't do any of it or I didn't do all of it by myself. I was asking the DMs at the game store about ideas and I was uh, bouncing ideas around on Discord, but definitely put a lot of effort into the first you know, five or six sessions. What is the worst or, or some of the worst mistakes you've made as a DM? And what lessons did you learn from these mistakes? I would consider my biggest mistake to be at a certain point when I was DMing, my style more became like very much sticking to the rules and just running combat. I ended up kind of finding my own fun was running combat and learning the new mechanics of these creatures. And I wasn't really considering the players fun and whether or not they were enjoying the combat. So I, I didn't really take their fun into account. And I had a few sessions that were just combat slogs and that didn't really provide any sort of uh, narrative progression or story or anything related to the characters motivations or anything. So I've since learned to give at least something towards a story in every combat encounter. So that's like if there was something a player noticed that affects like their backstory or if there was a, a further continuation of a motivation that an NPC PC had that was revealed during that combat, or maybe there was like some big epic backstabbing going on, some big plot twist that happened during the combat encounter, suddenly like a friendly NPC turns on the group in their weakest moment, right? So that can be really interesting. The other big mistake I made once was I was running the Lost Mine of Fandelver first encounter, and that is notorious for being extremely deadly if you know what you're doing. And because I did know what I was doing, the goblins properly used their stealth and were hiding after every crossbow shot or, or a shortbow shot. They ended up dealing enough damage to the party wizard to just down him in one hit. So he was dead for the entire session, and it was his first D&D &D session. I felt really bad about it. It's always about finding the balance, right, between using your, your most advanced tactics with new players or, or trying to break them in slowly. But you mentioned earlier, you, a lot of your sessions were combat slogs, and then you realized you needed to give them some plot points. And I think that's another important lesson about balance is you need to find what the party or what your players are interested in. And then from there, it's easy to kind of reverse engineer and figure out how you're going to tell your story in that way. I, I know I've definitely been guilty of, of things like that too, where the session is just one giant combat and everyone's kind of burned out afterward. What are some of your favorite encounters to throw at players to challenge them? It could be NPCs, it could be monsters, it could be puzzles or that kind of thing. There's a lot of memes about giving like fifth grader puzzles to a group of adults during D&D &D and then them like spending hours trying to figure out a solution. But I don't necessarily have a specific encounter. So one of my favorite NPCs that I've ever created, her name is Ma, uh, Ma Blackwater, uh, and she runs a tavern in a coastal port town that is full of uh, rough and tumble sailors and pirates and backwater. You know, you got the black market going on. She is a, a tough lady. Uh, she doesn't take any flack. Uh, she does not <laughs> take any flack, does not allow any kind of shenanigans in her tavern. She has a swear jar in her tavern and all of these sailors come in and they're all like swearing up a storm. She goes, nope, straight to the swear jar. Nice. She has the best food and, and all of the locals respect her. Mm. And if you, if you come into the tavern disrespecting her, the locals will either kick you out or put you in your place and you will learn to respect Ma. I may steal that one. Sure, go for it. On that note, what is a favorite memory of yours of improvisation, combat, role-playing? You know, just something that really always sticks out in your mind as a really fun thing that happened in one of your games that you like to tell people about. The one specific one that I recall as being the most memorable, uh, not just for me, but for the players that at the time at my table, was one day we were all sitting around. We didn't have the battle mat and materials and all of that. I, I didn't want to pull out all my miniatures and stuff, but we had dice, we had our character sheets, and that was about all we had. So I was running an encounter where a troop of bards had arranged a performance for a bunch of nobles in a city. And during this performance, the bards were going to cast sleep on the entire audience and then start picking their pockets because they're all nobles and these bards are obviously wanting to profit uh, off of these nobles. 
the party themselves were kind of escorting some of these nobles or were part of like the guard in in the room and they immediately sprang into action but there weren't weapons allowed in the theater and so the party had to find ways to to use their their improvised weapons by like picking up chairs or throwing punches uh, and some of their spells but they also had to make sure that they didn't wake up or hurt the nobles necessarily <laughs> So they were all trying to be really quiet, but also causing mayhem with these bards uh, that didn't know what was going on because they expected everybody to be asleep. How did they stay awake? Did they break in while it was happening, like they knew it was happening, or, or what? So the party members, most of them were elves, and they're immune to sleep magic. That helps. Or they succeeded on the save, or they had way more HP than the sleep spell would affect. Mm, yeah, low-level bards. That makes yeah. sense. It was all theater of the mind. We were doing this fight in a theater. I had like eight bards and they were all spellcasters. And it was a nightmare in my head to manage all of the distances and everything. But the fight ended up running into like the stage rafters and like they were climbing up ropes on the scene, the, the set pieces on, on the stage. And the party monk ended up climbing up a rope and chasing a couple of the bards out onto the rooftops through like a maintenance door up on top of the, the theater. And they were talking about that encounter like years later. They have this hatred for bards now. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about what D&D Compendium is, how it came to be, uh, you know, a little bit of history there just for, for the listeners so that they know a little bit about it. The D&D Compendium is a compilation of, of resources. I, I like to consider myself either an archivist or a curator, resident knowledge cleric. I don't know, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> so yeah, I, like a lot of DMs, uh, was gathering a bunch of bookmarks on my browser for useful tools. Yep. And I had about a hundred of them and I was trying to sort through the folders and all of that. And there's so many of us that do that. And I had at the point where it was over a hundred links, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to throw them on a Google doc and, and sort them and organize them. And then that naturally became its own thing. I, I was sharing that with friends. I was sharing that with Facebook groups and, and discord servers, and it grew to about 300 links. I was on the Discord and Dragons uh, Discord server that has about 25,000 people in it now. I was one of the original 1,000 and we were, uh, they had a, a resources channel where people were just throwing awesome things in there and that grew the Google Doc. So that's still active, but then I was kind of under pressure to make a website. So I, I looked over at Google Sites and it ended up being a pretty easy transition. Being able to copy paste from Google Docs was a big thing for me. So I was able to just build build pages off of that. So the D&D Compendium now has over a thousand links on it, and it has reached over one and a quarter million people as of today. Wow. One and a quarter million, you said, individual or, or unique IP addresses that have visited the site? Yeah, it's using Google Analytics. Um, I don't mm -hmm. have any ads or any other plugins or scripts or anything, but Analytics is running. And if you access it with a unique device from a unique uh, IP address, it will register as a user, I believe. Yeah, I think so, that's how it works. Done yeah. a little bit with Google Analytics. Wow, that's that's amazing. It started off as the bookmarks, then to Google Docs, and then you said, all right, I'm going to put this into a website, and here we are today. Indeed. As far as the curation process, how often are you making additions or edits to the site? Uh, and then people who have stuff they want to contribute. How can they contribute? Additions, edits to the site itself happen about once every two weeks or so. Sometimes people will submit things. I have a contribution page at the far right of the navigation bar. There's contribute. So it's mm -hmm. uh, dnd-compendium.com slash contribute. Uh, it has a, a Google form for submitting a resource. You can give me all the details and I will sort it onto a page on the site. There's a, a few hundred that have been actually submitted of various levels of things of quality. And sometimes people submit resources that I already have on the site. So that trigger, that tells me that I need to make that easier to find. What's your vetting process then to make sure that it's something that you feel is worth sharing or posting. I look at the resource. I determine, you know, is it a, is it a website that has tons and tons of ads? Because I don't want to promote websites with tons of ads because that's obnoxious. If it's a creator, is it a, is it good content? Is it like a blog or a or a podcast or an actual play live stream or something? Or is it a tool? Right. So tools get sorted much quicker onto the the website than these these other kind of subjective judgments of things. There is a bit of a process. I have a giant list of over 250 Discord servers that people are constantly trying to get their server added onto. I feel like if I had all of the D&D Discord servers on there, it would be thousands and there would be no way to know the quality of those communities. Have you created any resources for the site that you're particularly proud of? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, that Discord server list, that was a lot of work going in and finding good servers. And that's that's being managed at the moment. And then I actually wrote some content for the DMing tips page and the newbie guides page. I find a lot of value in the onboarding process for a system to be as simple as possible and easy to digest. Because I know coming at someone saying, you know, here, I have this website with a thousand links, like that is really overwhelming. Like, yes, it's useful, but I understand how overwhelmingly crazy that is to some people mm -hmm. who are wanting yeah. to get into a system and they just want to learn the basics and figure out how to, you know, how to start not just walking, but sprinting with the mechanics and understanding things. So I really spent a lot of time curating and organizing the order of resources and the content that I wrote on those pages to be easily digestible. Having curated and combed through and vetted thousands and thousands of resources to, you know, decide what to put on this compendium for Dungeon Masters, what have you found about the, the, all this content that's out there? What is useful and what isn't? You know, if, if someone is out there trying to decide what they can contribute to the, the TTRPG space. There's a lot of creators out there that want to contribute things. And I've found generally that there are a lot of people making either duplicates or very near duplicates of things that exist. For example, like spell lists or ways to present the monsters in the SRD. So what I've gone through over the vetting processes of looking at these tools is finding, you know, which ones have the best interface, which ones are the most user friendly for newbies, which ones are free. So I've learned generally that a lot of the biggest tools out there aren't necessarily the best. Yeah. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of indie, I guess you could call them indie developers, people that are just doing things by themselves that are making tools that are much more user-friendly than, than some of the big giants out there. Um, this is especially applicable to virtual tabletops. Uh, I know a lot of people get recommendations for Roll20 and occasionally Foundry. Um, mm -hmm. And they're both good in their own right. Uh, Foundry is incredibly customizable, but they don't see people recommending these other options that are sometimes, or, or often much, much smaller, but sometimes much more usable. Specifically for, for virtual tabletops, I recommend Tableplop and Albert Rodeo. With Tableplop, I got my players who had never used a virtual tabletop before. I got them up and running and moving tokens around with their character sheet within about half an hour. And it's mobile friendly, works on iPads and phones and, and tablets. People just want to roll dice and move things around on a grid. And when you have systems that have all of this fog of war stuff and abilities to create maps on them and like really advanced drawing tools, it can be a lot to kind of sink your teeth into, but it can also be really intimidating. Is there like a top list of things that, that people come to the site for, you know, based on your, your analytics? The vast majority of people that come into the site, like the first page they visit is the maps and map tools page. Like I think on Google, it's one of the top results for like D&D &D maps uh, or D&D &D map tools or like map making tools. Um, it shows up really high up on the list. So that that is usually the first page people see on the site. And then a lot of people also are searching for D&D &D traps and D&D &D puzzles. Uh, so that, that page is also really popular. And then outside of that, I think it's character sheets for people to print out or, or access or be able to save their character data. Not very many people actually are visiting the site from the home page, which is interesting. I got some suggestions about a homebrew page and adding a bunch of homebrew content, but I've found generally that it's really hard to vet that, vet that content and also make sure that it is useful generally. Mm -hmm. I have a section of homebrew that is on the, on the website, but I really try to point people elsewhere to find homebrew content. And I, I focus more on, on giving people the tools to make their own homebrew rather than putting the homebrew itself on the site. Additionally, I've found that for D&D Online, there are a few ways that people play at the moment. A lot of people play on those virtual tabletops. Some people do this kind of play by post where it's all just mm -hmm. text back and forth uh, yep. on Discord or on IRC chats. And the space for automation is wide open. There aren't very many good Discord bots for assisting with D&D roleplay. Uh, like you have Avray, which is the D&D Beyond bot. Uh -huh. um, tons and tons and tons of people have made dice rolling bots and maybe system reference bots, but there's not much else like managing a campaign or managing players or doing game posts and then people applying to those games or people that want to save their campaign notes in a journal, right? Those are not being used at all with with Discord. Mm. So a lot, of, a lot of open opportunities there then for you developers out there. Indeed. What are the top resources on the page, in your opinion, that you would suggest to every DM? So this is a question I get all the time. Okay, you have a thousand links. 
give me like five. Like what are the f like top five that you recommend? Because I'm not going to sort through a thousand links. You know, I, I try my best to make it digestible and like sorted and categorized and everything. They can go find their own stuff they want. But I have gotten this into kind of an elevator elevator pitch kind of thing. Like here's the top five. There are two categories. There's the resources that are used during gameplay and there are the resources that are used during game preparation. Okay. So I kind of have a top five for both. Perfect. So during play, there's an online DM screen that is really great for your system reference. Um, you can just scroll through it really quick. You can easily search stuff. There is a quick reference for actions and effects with like pictures and stuff. It's mobile friendly. A name generator. Having a name generator is really handy as a DM just on the side. Okay, I need a name. Click done. There is a table of voices. So as a DM, the player wants to go talk to a, a merchant. Okay, well, how do they sound? You know, what what race are they? You know, what is all this? So there's a D100 table of just like a high range voice or a warm and comforting voice. There's a whole page on the website for accents and language under the DM resources tab. So there's a lot more research there and a lot more you can fiddle with on making accents and making different NPC voices. And then music and sound adds a whole layer of immersion. I am an improvisational DM. I spend very little time prepping and I don't like to spend hours on just making maps and filling out character information and plot information, all of that. A lot of DMs enjoy that. It's not my thing. I don't have the time. So I like to get inspiration and then just kind of improv off of that. So there's a website called DND Speak that has fantastic lists of so many crazy awesome things. Like if I just open it up, it has Dwarven Insult Generator or 100 Curses, or 100 Interesting Books. You know, there are so many great places for inspiration on here. I think it's a fantastic tool just to look at and see, you know, where, where can I go from here? So dndspeak.com, and then there's uh, Encounter Generators. You know, if you don't know what you're doing with encounters um, and you don't want to read up on encounter design, um, you can just use a generator to throw in, like, I have five level five players and I want to have them fight something that's going to be hard for them to beat. Okay, go. Discord servers, I count as one whole resource. Finding people to talk with about your plans and share your best moments with is fantastic. Uh, the last one here is Matt Colville's Running the Game YouTube series. What advice do you have for D&D content creators out there to make their content interesting and different from the other options out there? So what, what makes things better and different and special? At the moment, there's a lot of push for uh, diversity and getting voices out there that are not in the the kind of main grain. The, the advice that I have for D&D content creators, the main one at the moment is to kind of A, be diverse, get people with different backgrounds, DMs who are just getting into the game, you know, figuring out what their experience is like uh, is valuable, mm -hmm. but it's very different from people who have been running the game for 40 years. You'll get different perspectives there. Also, DMs who run Adventures League, versus homebrew, uh, you know, structured games with different players every week versus a game that has been running for years with all the same people, you know, DMs who run the official modules, DMs who run games for children and people on the autism spectrum uh, and people with disabilities. Understanding how to make the game more accessible uh, is a huge topic at the moment, especially on Twitter, and is very popular uh, because we want to we want to be very inclusive gamers. We want to bring more people into the hobby, and we don't want to alienate or kind of gatekeep uh, anybody from from getting into something that's really should just be fun for everyone. It's like there, you get a lot of people kind of speaking about the same things for D and D, but you yeah. don't really hear people coming in from other systems and bringing ideas from those other systems and explaining why they're good and, and talking about the game design behind them and what what makes it a, a better experience for the players. What are your parting words of wisdom and encouragement to new and aspiring DMs out there? Shamelessly steal ideas. You mentioned earlier, uh, you're like, yeah, I'm going to steal that. I'm like, yeah, go for it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Take ideas from books, from movies, TV shows, you know, watch Dora the Explorer and <laughs> figure out what creates a, an engaging and fun adventure in a short time frame. It's pretty unlikely that your party is going to figure out exactly what you're stealing from. <laughs> yeah also focus on fun and not necessarily mechanics although you want to be consistent with your rules decisions so that the players aren't confused or arguing with you and this comes back to my you know my biggest mistake as a dm right was i wasn't focusing on the fun i was focusing on the mechanics and making sure everything was right and you know as the rules were written and i i see a lot of the times online they will they will ask for advice you know what are what are your tips for for new DMs, and then I see in the comments all the time, just have fun, two words. 
Yeah. And it is a really kind of uninspired piece of advice, just those two words. And I feel like it doesn't help very much because somebody doesn't know what that fun looks like at a table. And so it will take some finesse and some playing and experience to figure out what that fun is for you and for your players, for DMs to have fun at the table. Uh, it's also a big thing. DMs are a player too, and they deserve to have fun. You know, if the DM is not having fun, definitely talk with your players and figure out what is your fun and what do you want to do? How do you want to progress with the game so that everybody is having fun? Great advice. And then don't prep plots. Prepare motivations for non-player characters because motivations drive plot. The things that people want that lead to them doing things to help them gain those things that they want. And so the encounters that you design come from those motivations. What are these actions that these NPCs are taking to get towards their goal? Because that will allow you to suddenly have narrative in all of your encounters. They have reasons. Um, I wrote in my notes on here, I, I mentioned something called four levels of why. This is something that I use in my encounters sometimes where I think of an encounter. I'm like, okay, there's, there's orcs in a castle and the party's going to clear out the castle. Okay, why mm -hmm. are the orcs there? Uh, maybe, maybe they want to expand their empire or whatever. Okay, why do they want to expand? Okay, for for domination or whatever. And then why do they want domination? You know, because they're that's that's what they do. You could have much more interesting versions of that, but you want to continually ask yourself why is this happening and why is that happening? Because if the players are going to ask questions, you have answers. Yeah, it's almost like peeling the layers back and making sure that at the core there's a reason for things happening. Right. I like it. Coming off of that though is like improv improvisation is the best world builder. The party goes into a town and you know you, you can come up with all these these people in the town you can describe them but then you say you know this, this one person is missing a finger. The more you look around you notice there's a few people that are missing fingers. Suddenly the players grab onto that and they go maybe there's some importance there. In your head you go okay maybe there there wasn't before but now there is. You come up with things on the spot or players will ask questions about your world and as you come up with answers you know, write them down. They have just been helping you build the world for you. They ask these questions that make you give answers that you can logically come up with reasons for that help you build your world. You know, use resources, use gameplay aids, uh, use things that help you track initiative, uh, use system reference that is easy for you to use, find generators that help you, you know, find maps that people have made, ask for help. Big thing there. There's no shame in asking for help. And you don't have to do everything on your own as a DM. Uh, it can be really overwhelming. There's a lot to remember, lots of rules to figure out. Combat can be confusing. You know, what is concentration? How do we do like all of these status effects? What is what is all of this? Ask other people to to run you through a round of combat. Uh, there's actually a Discord server called D&D uh, &D Newbie Sessions where they host games for DMs in training. They can figure out how to run a combat session, how to run a little bit of a role play, how to bring the role play out from your players and and coming off of that uh, let the players play a lot of dms kind of get this this power fantasy going where where they just want to control everything and are, are telling their players what they can do on their turn and not really just stepping back and letting them play sometimes of course if they don't know anything that they can do nudge them, tell them that they can do things and maybe provide some options for things they might not know about. Like, oh, hey, you can dodge on your turn. It's not on your character sheet, but it's an action you can do. Mm -hmm. And and don't expect the players to act in a way that you can predict. Uh, this this goes all the way back to the, the don't prep plots things. Your players are going to do things that you didn't expect. Again, you know, your your world building supports your improv and your improv supports your world building. So... If you have to improvise because a player is doing something you didn't predict, don't get mad at that player. Change something up. Take a five minute break and think about the consequences of what that player is doing and how your world might respond to that. What are the rippling effects of the actions that your players are taking in your world? And then this last point I have is that any effort that you put into including the players in the story will be appreciated. You are not running a novel. You are running an interactive, collaborative, storytelling, video game slash movie slash TV show. It's very much free form in a lot of ways. When you bring the players into the story, they get attached to the story and they care about things. And when the players care about things, they feel included and they feel like they are contributing to the table and the, and the table's fun. That is where 
the magic of D&D comes out and the effort that you put in to designing the game and the, and the encounters that you have and the relationships that the players have with each other and with the NPCs in your world, all of that will be appreciated. Yeah, I know my game became 10 times more engaging and interesting to my players when I realized that point and started asking them, what, you know, what's next for your character? What are their goals? You know, what do they want to accomplish in this next story arc? And it's just made it so much better. Not that it wasn't fun before, but, you know, they're, they're just bought in now and they are really getting something out of it. Like you said, they're becoming attached to it. I love that. Other than the compendium, what are some of the projects that you're working on now that you want to plug here? I have an adventure in the works. Uh, I've been working on it for a while. I'm part of the Adventure Writers Guild, and it is being designed for uh, levels one to five with the intent on leveling up after each session, so about five sessions. Uh Um, A lot of the design is being fine-tuned to introduce new gameplay elements kind of bit by bit to both the DM and the players, so it's really newbie-friendly. It only has maybe like two combat encounters, like one kind of small one and then like the big final one uh, without giving too much away. I'm also working on a Discord bot. Uh, At the moment, I I feel really confident with Python. I've been working on a Discord bot that will be able to manage channels, roles, and members of a campaign being run on Discord. So this is being designed with the intent of having large servers um, and even small servers, but specifically for servers that are hosting several games or on the server, being able to manage players in different campaigns and also being able to to track disciplinary stuff, keeping track of like when a player is banned and stuff. So that's that's a big project in the work. I'm currently unemployed, so I've got a lot of free time suddenly. So I'm I am hireable. I do Python development and I'm familiar with uh, doing APIs and databases and obviously content organization with my website. You know, organizing a thousand links as a bit of a task. But yeah, that's uh, that's me. Thanks for joining us, and we really appreciate you taking the time. And I think the whole D and D community also thanks you for the hundreds, if not thousands, of hours you have spent uh, on our behalf, making it easier to run the game. So, uh, yeah, from all of us, thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us on How Not to DM. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode and share the podcast with your friends and family around your table. For episode guest announcements, link to our Discord community, blog, and social media accounts, visit at HN, the number two, DM on Twitter. If there's a DM out there who you think would be cool to hear from on the show, email us at hownottodm at gmail.com and we'll be in touch. Our awesome intro and outro music is by my good friend Torin. And until next time, roll some nat 20s for me.